Good morning. Welcome to the New York Botanical Garden. We're so glad you're here. A little bit of rain did not keep you away from this beautiful place. And the Doppler radar will reward you. It's going to be sunny at 11 o'clock. The garden looks like a really big tree oasis itself here at the Botanical Garden. A perfect setting then to celebrate this Climate Week New York City and to discuss one of today's most acclaimed books around the world in 80 trees. I am Vanessa Sellers and run the Andrew W. Mellon sponsored Humanities Institute situated here in the Mertz Library upstairs, working to bring together the sciences and humanities. And many of you here are familiar with our Friday morning science, conservation, humanities um, discussions. What better topic today than to fulfill that mission than today's book? A, a book presentation that features the relationships between humans and trees. Especially in a time, if we think of this climate week, especially in a time when so many trees for the first time after hundreds of years are truly suffering because of our climate change. What better person than John Drury, a tree specialist and nature lover, to speak to us about trees and about his new book. This book has been praised in the newspapers, online, it is just starting to really take off in the United States of America. In Europe, it already has quite a following. And as you will see when you go online, it has all these wonderful discussions saying this is the best love letter I have ever read on the topic of trees. John Dory will tell us then something about their key role in human lives, in our lives, and as a matter of fact, in life as a whole. If you came here probably this morning thinking of one of a tree or two that has been very important in your life and you remembered probably all kinds of things suddenly from childhood sitting under a tree or thinking and that is one of the things why you love the New York Botanical Garden. So we are very lucky this morning to be one of the first recipients here on the East Coast to have John Drury give his first official presentation and book signing along the East Coast in New York City here. And John Drury had a quite remarkable career, and still has. Um, he's a well-known author. He's also the trustees of the Eden Project, familiar to some of you. Some of you have been educated there. And also is um, the ambassador for the World Wildlife Fund a chairman of Ravensbourne University in London. Previously, he was trustee of the Royal Botanic Gardens Q and the UK Woodland Trust, as well as a BBC science documentary filmmaker. He has also given various TED Talks, which you will be able to check after today, uh, about scientific and botanical themes, ranging from pollen to the sex life of flowers, and in 2006, he was awarded a special honor of Her Majesty the Queen. I'm not sure what that meant. We will ask that later. And after the lecture, there will also be an opportunity to ask your questions. We will run around with a microphone, and then you can ask John Dory what you um, like to ask. And finally, um, you will afterwards walk to the Ross Gallery and get for all your friends some decent autumn reading and get the book signed with a private personal message. It is now my great and distinct pleasure to invite our speaker to the podium, John Drury. Please uh, help me in welcoming him. Okay, now it's working. Uh, so you're very wise sitting next to the exit. You never know when you might have to make a quick getaway. I uh, <laughs> can understand you wanting to do that. Um, uh, look, British humour doesn't necessarily travel, so uh, just <laughs> laugh politely most of the time. That will be good. That would be great. Um, uh, what I plan to do is, is 
you know, you don't want to hear 80 biographies of trees. Uh, you might want to read about those. Uh, but so I'll sort of mention some things from the book and maybe uh, read a couple of little bits. But I just wanted to talk generally about trees for about the next 45 minutes. Now, um, how many people here are working scientists or botanists? Okay, so there's a few. So you guys are not going to heckle, all right? Uh, that's the most important thing, because I don't want to look stupid in front of a foreign audience. So here's me. Uh, I'm, I'm the little guy here. Um, in about 1967, I think, and that's the Royal Botanic Gardens queue with the big palm house in the background, and my dad there, who always seemed to wear a suit for going, <laughs> to, going to botanic gardens. Um, and he had studied botany, but being a new immigrant to the country, needed to retrain in engineering, because I didn't need too many desert botanists when he arrived just before the war. And uh, one of the things that he uh, did was that he uh, tried to interest my brother, who was seven years older than me, and myself in plants by telling us stories about all the plants. And uh, a couple of the plants that he, I remember very vividly the stories that he told us. Um, this one here you probably recognize. This is an opium poppy. And the, the way that he told us these stories was to give us bits of the plants to eat, right? And uh, we would somehow remember better. Uh, and, <laughs> I remember having a lick of this opium, not that particular opium poppy, but a, a, an opium poppy growing, growing at Kew. And I remember my tongue going ever so slightly numb. Um, and that's about all that happened. Uh, the neighbors had a good reaction, which was, uh, which was very exciting for me. Um, and at school, they were kind of quite interested and I think had a word with my parents. But I remember uh, that was my way in to hearing about uh, sort of how science and culture are related. And, of course, he told us the story about, uh, you know, heroin and, and, and other drugs made out of opium. And then this plant here, I don't know if it's a common pot plant in this country, but in uh, Britain, uh, it's called Diffenbachia. And you have it, I think it's quite well known in this country. It's not very well known. The history of this plant is not well known in Europe. It probably is to you. Uh, and, of course, it has the, uh, the common name of dumb canes. And I remember my father taking a piece of the leaf about an inch square and giving it to, to me and said to me, now, this is going to hurt, but I need to tell you the story behind this plant. And it did hurt a lot, actually, but it's a sort of pain where if someone tells you it's going to happen, it's not so bad, you know. Um, and uh, this was the plant that my father used to tell my brother, well, my brother already knew, but to tell me as aged about seven or eight the story of slavery because this is the plant that uh, was fed to, uh, you know, horrifically uh, fed to, to uh, the time of slavery to people um, as a punishment. And so the combination of the scientific story, which is that there's a poison in this plant, and the crystals, tiny needle-like crystals in the cells of the, the plant that enable the poison to go into the, uh, through the membranes of the mouth much more easily than without those little tiny microscopic crystals in it. That was the sort of scientific story combined with uh, this very, very uh, horrific uh, but important uh, story about slavery. And uh, I remember, oh, look, I'll just read you a bit from um, uh, about trees now. Uh, but, you know, just to give you a sort of feel for my, my sort of family life, one of my earliest memories is of a spectacular cedar of Lebanon near our home. One winter morning, we found it dead, its trunk and limbs strewn haphazardly and being sawn up. It had been struck by lightning. That was the first time I saw my father cry. I thought about the huge, heavy, beautiful thing that was hundreds of years old and that I had thought invincible and wasn't. And my father, who I had thought would always be in benign control of everything and wasn't. I recall my mother saying that there had been a whole world in that tree, and I remember puzzling over that. But my mother was right. There was a whole world in that tree, and so there is in every tree. That, that's from the introduction to the book. And uh, as I uh, sort of grew up, I had the opportunity to visit lots and lots of trees around the world. Um, first uh, as a documentary filmmaker, and then uh, just sort of traveling for the fun of it. Um, and one of the things that struck me was just the amazing variety just in the, in the land of trees. Um, the wax palms over there of, of Colombia, the quiver tree uh, of Namibia, um, you know, the, the fantastic uh, fig family trees of, of uh, South Asia, just amazingly, amazingly different. 
And I started to wonder, well, you know, what is it that trees actually need? How, you know, and, and, and what, would we, what would the world look like if we looked at it from the point of view of a tree? And of course, you know, one of the first things that trees need is water. And you look at a tree, uh, that's a person, that's actually my wife. <laughs> um, you know, these are the, uh, the uh, uh, redwoods over in California. And you think, how does the tree get water all the way from here up to the very tip top of the tree? And, you know, when we design pumps and things, uh, trying to raise water over hundreds and hundreds of feet is a really difficult thing. Water's heavy. Uh, how do you get it up to the top? Now, here's an interesting little coincidence that the very tallest tall trees, um, which uh, at the moment are the coastal redwoods, but occasionally you get very, very tall individual um, uh, exa specimens of other trees, uh, like the swamp gum uh, in Australia or the Douglas fir. And if you look at the very, very tallest of the tall trees, and you look at the fossil record, and you see which were the tallest trees ever in, uh, on the planet that we found fossils of, it turns out that the height of those trees is all pretty much the same. And that is uh, doing a quick conversion from uh, metric to uh, imperial here. Uh, is 120 meters, about 380 feet. Is that about right? Okay. Uh, so they're all about the same. And you think, isn't that a remarkable coincidence? And now, scientists argue over this, but the latest theory about how trees get water to the very tip top of a tall tree is called the tension cohesion theory. I'll be testing you on it afterwards. <laughs> and think of it this way, that at the very top of the tree, there's water kind of evaporating off. And that causes a tiny little vacuum that draws water from the next cell down, um, all the way down through the tree. So you get a little vacuum, it's sort of sucking the water up, if you can imagine that. Um, and it so happens that uh, with about 120 feet or so, uh, sorry, 300, 120 meters, 380 feet or so, that a, a column of water all the way down the tree, effectively, can be supported um, without it sort of pulling apart. Now, if you've worn a, a raincoat in the rain and you see the little globules of water that form, it, it, that, that isn't what oil does, and it's not what alcohol does. Um, it forms these little globules that pull themselves together. It coheres, right? It it's, it's, has this property that um, water coheres to itself. And it's that property that enables the tree to drag the water up through the tree, uh, through the tree because it's, it's pulling itself along. And uh, that coherence only works up to a point. Um, if, the, uh, t if the column is too long, then the hydrogen and oxygen bonds in the water are just not strong enough to hold it together. And so what I really like about this is that anywhere in the universe with the same gravity as us, the trees will only be the same height as 120 meters or so. Uh, I just think that's fantastically neat, really. Um, that there's something kind of really profound about the height of trees just by, by sort of looking at them. So another thing that trees need, as, as we do, is food. And I have a question for you, and what I want you to do mentally, not physically, right, mentally, is have a piece of paper on which you're going to write down a word or two, all right? So you don't have to do it for real. So a little seed weighs next to nothing, right? And a bag of charcoal... You have charcoal, right? <laughs> okay. A bag of charcoal that obviously is made out of wood that came from a tree that grew from a little thing, right? So the charcoal weighs a lot, and the tree weighs a lot. So my question to you is, and we're just looking for a one or two word written down <laughs> mentally, where did the tree get the stuff from? Where did all the mass come from? So this is heavy, and that doesn't weigh anything much. So where did all the stuff come from? Now, I've never done this in the United States, but I know from, a, uh, from audiences elsewhere in Europe that most people will have on their little kind of hypothetical card on their, uh, in their heads uh, something like nutrients from the soil. I see some nodding here. Um, now, if that was the case, 
I don't know about you, but in Europe, we don't have trucks driving around at night filling in the soil that the tree has somehow taken out of the ground, right? So, and if you've got a pot plant at home, you might have noticed that um, you hardly ever have to top up the soil, and yet you get this great big plant. So it can't really have come out of the soil. And I also know from audiences that I've researched elsewhere that some people will say, oh, it comes out of sunlight, because you've heard of photosynthesis. And the thing about sunlight is that it really doesn't weigh anything. Have you ever tried weighing sunlight? So if, if you think, as, as I should think about 10% of the audience probably does, that uh, the seed turns into, you know, gets mass from sunlight, uh, you think that sunlight doesn't weigh anything, and we know it doesn't come out of the ground. And the answer is the mass of, of charcoal, which is all carbon, came from carbon dioxide in the air. And uh, that's quite difficult for some people to grasp because they feel that air doesn't really weigh anything. But actually, that's a quite important thing to know, that what plants do for a living is this sort of magic thing of taking water and carbon dioxide, cooking them up together in a process called photosynthesis, which uses sunlight as the source of energy, and creating heavy stuff, cellulose, sugar, you know, all that stuff that trees are made of. Um, now, it is true that uh, trees need some other bits and pieces. And the way they get those other bits and pieces, things like phosphorus and magnesium and, and nitrates in the soil, is through their roots. Okay, so they do draw up some nutrients, but that's hardly any of the mass. And the interesting thing about the, the root system is that we now think that uh, most trees, probably 90, 95% of trees, actually grow in symbiosis with something called mycorrhizae. This is a fantastic word to know for Scrabble, okay? <laughs> very, very high scoring. And it, it, the picture there is, the main picture is, is a root, and round it are these tiny filaments, filaments of fungal fibers. And there's this relationship between the fungi and the, the tree. So what the fungus isn't very good at is getting hold of sugar. All right? And the tree is really good at that. It makes it from, from, from photosynthesis. But the, tree, the tree's roots aren't always really good at picking up these extra little micronutrients they need from the soil. And the fungus is really good at that. So they team up. And the fungus um, will often actually sort of infiltrate into this is the root here. And the fungus can infiltrate into the root of the tree. Um, so they're really absolutely almost like one organism, but they're, they're, they're separate, but they're teaming up. And the fungus gets um, uh, the sugars that it needs, and the tree um, gets the, the phosphorus and, and other, other chemicals that it needs. Very clever. Um, now, uh, not too many young kids in the audience, so I can read you this about the birch tree. <laughs> So everyone knows what a birch tree looks like. I'm sure you do. Trees often develop symbiotic relationships with mycorrhizal fungi, which intermingle with their roots and extend beyond them in a huge web of minutely thin filaments. These networks are especially good at extracting nutrients from the soil, which they pass on in an easily digestible form. In return, the fungus receives sugars from the tree. Individual tree species cooperate with particular fungi, the birch's life partner is Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric, whose fruiting bodies, the parts we see above ground, are scarlet with white sprinkles, the archetypal toadstools of every fairy tale. Fly agarics contain a cocktail of mind-bending hallucinogens around which all manner of shamanistic rituals have evolved, particularly among Siberian tribes and the Sami people of northern Finland and Sweden. So far, so human. Many cultures have psychedelic traditions. However, the fly agaric's psychoactive ingredients are not completely broken down in the body, but excreted. This offers the enticing possibility of intoxication and a spot of social bonding by drinking the pre-drugged urine of others. It, you can laugh at this point, that's okay. So, it's true that northern nights are especially long, and the forests might have been lacking in other excitement. However, one can't help wondering whether this practice was really as widespread as the few historic travelers who seem to be the common source of all the shamanistic pee-drinking stories 
were told and so eagerly reported. You heard it here first. <laughs> so we've got water, we've got food, and trees need to defend themselves. So when a, a, an insect sees that, uh, or any other herbivore for that matter, they probably think lunch, right? They probably think there, there's a feast. And trees can't up sticks and run away. So they, uh, they need to defend themselves. And trees have created this huge variety of ways to fend off things that would eat them and attack them. Um, obviously, they have to deal with all the bacteria and uh, you know, uh, um, fungi and things that will attack them. That's a whole other story. But there, you know, the, the um, uh, pachypodium of, of Madagascar at the top left, the, the um, uh, sandbox tree of Costa Rica at the top there, they have these fantastic spines. Um, oak trees, where I live in, uh, in, in Britain, um, have tannins in them. Uh, many, many deciduous trees have lots of tannin. Uh, it's a, a chemical that not only we use for tanning our, our leather and so on, uh, but is, is uh, rather difficult for herbivores to, uh, to cope with. Another thing that oak, oak trees and many other trees do is that if, if I go and attack an oak tree by scrunching up some leaves, um, nothing terribly much happens. But if a, um, uh, if, if a herbivore starts attacking or a group of insects start attacking a tree, uh, there's a, um, uh, the tree starts making defense chemicals. Those defense chemicals are rather expensive for the tree to, to make, so it doesn't have them on tap all the time. It starts churning them out. And uh, when they waft around in the air, that triggers other trees nearby to start making those chemicals as well. So there's a kind of information transfer. I, I, I don't always like to call it communication because people start thinking of sentient beings. But certainly there is communication in, in information terms between one tree and another one. And you remember I told you about those mycorrhizal fungi? Um, those networks underground, they're not just hoovering up nutrients and so on, but they're also uh, uh, taking messages from uh, one tree to another, often of a different species, saying, I'm under attack and uh, you know, uh, you need to start, well, <laughs> there's no intention here, but the, uh, the tree over there starts making um, chemicals to defend itself, and those signals can go on, underground. So the, the time it would take for that signal to go from here to the exit in the corner there might be about a quarter of an hour or so. Okay, but, um, and some very elegant experiments where they've uh, tracked the chemicals that are going uh, you know, put radioactive markers on them and can see that where they're going underground and so on. Um, very nice experiments. Then you've got uh, the, uh, a mansion eel, which is a, I don't know if anyone's ever come across one, but for goodness sake, avoid it. It's a, uh, just about every part of the tree is horribly caustic. Um, this is caffeine. This is, this is coffee, right? And, you know, plants have caffeine in order to ward off insects, which, uh, you know, it's, a po it's poisonous to insects. But interesting thing, some very elegant experiments were done which show that bees, uh, I mean, normally you wouldn't put caffeine in the nectar of flowers because you want bees and other insects to come and visit and, and, uh, and do some pollination for you. But uh, it turns out that if there's a tiny bit of caffeine in the nectar, then bees remember those flowers better than <laughs> as a result, which is kind of what every student knew, I should think. Um, do you remember the, uh, uh, um, the, the leader of um, uh, North Korea, his brother was poisoned at uh, an airport uh, with a two-part poison. So someone came out and put something on him and then they, someone else put the other thing on him. The, the, this plant, cherry laurel, um, has two-part poison uh, in the leaves so that uh, you know, it, it doesn't bother making the poison until something come along, comes along, chomps on the leaf, instantly makes cyanide. Uh, very amazing. And this one is one of my favorites. This is, there are quite a few plants that do this. That they, they exude this kind of uh, nectar, I suppose, when, when something, uh, a caterpillar, comes and, and eats it. And that nectar um, is not poisonous to the caterpillar, but it's incredibly attractive to the thing that eats the caterpillar. Yeah. Isn't that sweet? Smart. Yeah, very smart. We could learn a lot from trees, I think. Uh, that, uh, I wanted to put some images in from the, um, the book just to give you a sort of feel for it. These are uh, done by a French artist called Lucille Clerc. 
And this tree is the Kauri, K-A-U-R-I, from New Zealand. And uh, it, uh, in common with many other trees, exudes a, a, um, a very sort of uh, pungent resin. And that resin uh, that trees often have, cedars and, and, and all sorts, uh, is there basically to engulf or poison insects that would attack the tree. And there was a whole industry of, uh, uh, of gum diggers and people who would climb up the tree in their <laughs> little boots uh, to uh, slash the trees and, and so on. Um, but under the ground, uh, basically they wanted the, um, the resin for making varnish with, so that it was all shipped back to Europe for making varnish. And in the uh, uh, 19th century, there was a resin rush to New Zealand in the way that you had the gold rush here. They had a resin rush. 10,000 prospectors from all over the world arrived, um, and they had these uh, sort of steel rods that they'd poke under the ground, uh, the really big lumps of resin that had been sort of accreting there for thousands of years. Uh, they could find them by the tone changing as they put in the rod, and then they'd sort of flick the rod and listen. And, they could, and then they'd dig up these pieces of resin that would require two men to lift, really, really big pieces of resin. And uh, the, uh, it was an absolutely huge business for New Zealand. And the whole of the modern infrastructure of New Zealand, all the sort of unfortunate, in one way, forest clearance, the um, building of hospitals, schools, roads, all that kind of thing, was built on tax money from the resin industry. Uh, amazing uh, that, uh, uh, you know, there was this, for, for sort of 20 or 30 years, this was a, the, the biggest export from New Zealand, more than gold or wool or anything else. And then uh, there was the, uh, the gutta percha rush. <laughs> gutta percha, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of gutta percha. Um, it's, a, uh, it, it's a bit like rubber, uh, but in the 19th century, uh, there were all sorts of tales of uh, daring do and uh, excitement and so on. Uh, first of all, there were a whole lot of entrepreneurial companies set up to make these sort of objects out of gutta percha, which is a, the latex, essentially, from this tree that grows in, in Borneo and, Malaya, and Malaysia. Uh, and then someone found an amazing use for it. And the amazing use for it was that it was the one material they could use for making the insulation for submarine cables for telecommunications. And the whole of modern telecommunications um, is, uh, it was dependent in the 19th century on uh, these submarine cables. Uh, they, they, went, they spanned the globe, um, hundreds of thousands of miles of them, actually, quarter of a million miles of submarine cables uh, were all insulated with the, re with the latex from the gutta percha tree, um, which, of course, the tree had uh, evolved in order to ward off insects that would attack it. Um, there actually aren't any kids here, are there? That's good. So, <laughs> not that I don't like kids, it's just that the, the next bit is. So, I, I want to tell you about another uh, resin, uh, and this is the, uh, the resin of the, the Japanese, or sometimes called the Chinese, lacquer tree. So, you know about these wonderful uh, objects that are made out of lacquer. And lacquer is actually a, a polymer, so it's like a plastic, really. And if you can imagine the world before plastics were invented, a thousand years ago, hundreds of years ago, people making these objects which would have been painted in multiple, multiple layers. What an amazing material it would have been. Waterproof, all the things that we think of, as, uh, you know, that, that plastics have given us. Um, and uh, but there is another aspect to the sap from this tree. The creepiest historical use of the lacquer tree must be that of an obscure sect of ascetic northern Japanese monks intent on becoming sokushin butsu, or living Buddhas, as a route to enlightenment. The whole journey lasted several years and started with a slow reduction in the intake of food and an especially slimming diet of seeds, nuts, roots, and bark. With the intention of their corpses becoming a whole-body relic, the monks then gradually embalmed or mummified themselves by drinking urushi tea made from the sap of the lacquer tree. After becoming horribly dehydrated slowly, their bodies were resistant to decay and too poisonous or unpleasant even for maggots. Years after death, the monks, that's $2,000 to, to the botanic gardens, that's excellent. Um, <laughs> Dehydrated and dying slowly, their bodies were resistant to decay and too poisonous or unpleasant even for maggots. 
Three years after death, the monks' tombs were opened, and those few who had not decomposed were said to have achieved Buddhahood. It's suicide. The practice was made illegal only in the late 19th century, and several Japanese temples still exhibit gruesomely well-preserved remains that are claimed to be those of self-mummified monks. And in fact, when you go, they, they put dark glasses on them, <laughs> uh, which looks very, very odd. But I don't know whether that's because the eyeballs haven't survived or because it's just one of those creepy things that they do in Japan. Uh, so that, that's uh, uh, another illustration of, of the lacquer tree. Um, the, the alder, I don't know if uh, alders grow particularly well in, in uh, uh, this region of North America, but they, they tend to grow well by water. And one of the things about the alder tree um, is that it, it's uh, very, very resistant to rot. Uh, and it, it also has a relationship with some bacteria that live in little nodules um, in, the, in the roots that help it to get some of those extra nutrients in waterlogged soil. So you often find, find it around lagoons and so on. And the Venetians, um, thinking about where they were going to put what became Venice, uh, realized that they needed something that they could drive into the mud of the lagoon uh, that wouldn't rot. And they immediately went to the alder tree. And even to this day, the Ponte Vecchio and most of the buildings actually in, in Venice are still supported on piles made out of alder wood. Now, the other thing about alderwood is I don't suppose many of you read military manuals on making gunpowder, uh, bedtime reading. But if you, but if you do, uh, oddly enough, I don't know why the, the uh, governments would need gunpowder anymore when there are so many other explosives, but when they do need gunpowder, they specify, certainly in Europe, that it should be made out of alderwood charcoal. Interesting thing, um, uh, because it seems to make the best charcoal. And of course, the other thing that charcoal would have been used for by the Venetians, apart from making the gunpowder for their cannons, uh, would be the cannons themselves, because the steel would have been smelted using charcoal. And so alder wood was fantastically strategically important to the Venetians in, say, the 15th century. Uh, they depended on it for their weaponry, um, for the explosives to go in that weaponry, and also for the architecture that was supported. And so this was fantastically uh, strategic wood and it protected forests and people were um, you know, punished uh, if, they, if they would take trees from it without permission and so on. Uh, it was amazing to think that the, this empire was built on that. At the height of the empire, um, they could build, in a, in a sort of production line, uh, they could build one ocean-going ship fully kitted out with cannons and explosives and everything else, one a day. Isn't that unbelievable? Um, I don't know about your country, but in mine, we wouldn't be able to do that anymore. And uh, the place they did that, of course, was called the Arsenale, which is where we get the word arsenal. Um, here's a, uh, another kind of defense. This is the, um, it, it's, it's called the whistling thorn or drapanolobium from uh, East Africa. And I don't know if you can see, but these thorns have a sort of, uh, a, a spherical base to them. And that spherical base is the home of these incredibly aggressive ants. Um, so that uh, the tree has provided a home for the ants. And if anything brushes against that tree, believe me, you really don't want to, um, then the ants come rushing out and bite like frenzy. And, and these are no nice little common or garden ants. They're really unpleasant. And if two trees grow where they're swishing against each other, then the two colonies of ants will fight to the death, which is a sort of slightly surprising thing. But the, these uh, thorns, when the wind rushes through them, they make this kind of slightly whistling noise. It's just a, a, you know, a feature of the, um, the, the aerodynamics. And large herbivores, elephants and so on, um, they have learned to keep away from that noise. So you can just make that noise and they'll steer clear. Uh, just because they know that going near one of those trees is going to be really quite painful. There's a, an illustration from the book. Okay, so we need to talk about sex, I'm afraid. And uh, uh, this is going to be awkward because I'm English. Um, so, so trees need to make more trees. Okay, that's the sort of, you know, that's how nature works, all right? And there are two ways, essentially, they can do this. They can do this by having sex 
or by not having sex. So let's talk about not having sex, all right? And then we'll come on to the other bit if we're ready for it later. So the way that you can make other trees or propagate yourself by not having sex is by cloning, all right? And so clumps of aspens do this. Um, the, the, all these aspens in one clump are essentially, uh, they're all identical twins. Uh, they don't look exactly like identical twins because they um, have had lif different life experiences, you know, different amounts of wind or, or wear or whatever. But essentially, they're clones of each other, right? And the advantage of that for the aspen is that it can colonize really fast. Uh, but the disadvantage is that if something, uh, some disease attacks one, it, basically they'll all be susceptible, right? Because they, they'll all... Uh, the, the, none of them would have any resistance. If one doesn't, they'll all, they're all the same. Okay. So when the Romans came to uh, Britain, as it, as it now is, um, they brought with them um, elm trees for uh, essentially for growing their vines up, right? because the Romans were partial to wine. And elm, elm trees, the variety they brought, tend to spread by suckering. Right, which are these sort of li little um, shoots that come out near the bottom of the tree and they sort of hop to the next, or you can take cuttings and so on. And the, that was great because they managed to get them everywhere. <laughs> but the disadvantage was that all those trees are genetically very, very similar to each other. So when a disease came along, unfortunately called Dutch elm disease, it was just the, it's all called Dutch elm because they were the ones who identified it. <laughs> so it's uh, associated. That's another $2,000 to the... Uh, uh, botanic garden, that's good. Um, so uh, when Dutch elm disease came, uh, spread by the, it's a fungus spread by beetles, um, and uh, some of those trees were susceptible, they were all susceptible because they're genetically incredibly similar to each other. So it's great if you want to colonize somewhere quickly, but not great if you uh, want to be resistant to disease. Uh, aspens get around this problem by... Uh, it, it, within a clump, these will all be the same genetically, but from clump to clump, there are actually some, some quite big differences. So that, that they've evolved to do that. So all the grasses, which are most of the food crops we eat, right, in terms of wheat, rice, barley, all of those things, um, they, uh, they, do, uh, they basically have sexual reproduction, which a lot of trees do as well. And they do this by chucking out something called pollen, um, if you have hay fever, you'll know all about pollen. And uh, essentially, pollen grains, which are about a 50th of a millimeter, Lord knows what that is in inches, a 50th of a millimeter um, uh, across, the, there are two ways that the tree c or the plant can spread the pollen around. So the, if you're going to have sexual reproduction, you need to get your male sex cells from your tree or from your plant to the female bits I think we'll call it that, uh, <laughs> of another plant, okay? So how are you going to do that? How are you going to get the pollen, which contains the male sex cells, from over here all the way to some tiny, itty-bitty little bit of another plant? Two ways of doing this, right? One way is to throw all the pollen to the wind. So that's what all those, those grasses do. That's what trees like the alder does and the willow. And under an electron microscope, you can see that the pollen has this sort of uh, aerodynamic shape. You know, it just flies easily on, on, on the breeze. Um, hazel and walnut, every home should have an electron microscope, really. Um, the, sycam the sycamore. Um, but there, there has to be a better way, because you're chucking this stuff out and just hoping it lands on the right bits. And the way, there's another way of doing it, which is um, to have a go-between take the pollen to exactly where it needs to go to, right? So the pollen containing the male sex cells, you can stick in a flower and then make the flower really bright and gaudy so something will come along and look at it and think, oh, that looks interesting. And maybe you could offer something in return, like some nectar, some sweet nectar. Sweet nectar is incredibly expensive and difficult for the flower to produce, as it, uh, for the plant to produce, as are these beautiful bright colors. That, that, this is chemically expensive thing to do. Right, and difficult. But in return, you don't have to make so much pollen and just hope that it goes to the female bits of another flower. You get an insect to go just right there, okay, and hit that spot. Um, here's an example of pollen, uh, which is 
it, it has evolved to uh, be spread by insects. And you can see it's got these little kind of uh, spikes on that kind of glom onto insect legs really well. I, I particularly like this one because the, the crack across the middle here shows that it's been fossilized. And this was found under London. So I love the idea that millions of years ago there were mangroves growing under London. And there's the mangrove from the, uh, from the book. Um, the horse chestnut, I, I, A, I wanted to show you this because it's just such a, it's impossible not to see these as eyes, eyes really. The horse chestnut has a very interesting way. I, I think you call these buckeyes in this country, the horse chestnut. So um, uh, they have a, an interesting way of spreading the, the pollen, which is uh, partly by wind, but mostly using insects. And the tree does a deal with the insects. Here's the, um, the, all the florets, uh, each containing some nectar uh, and each containing the pollen that needs to get to another tree. And uh, you know, for, for if you imagine you're a bee, uh, you want to make sure that there's some nectar available when you get there. And if you're a tree, then if you've already got your pollen from a particular flower already taken and taken somewhere else, then there's no point in having a bee come and visit you, right? So they've come to this arrangement, which is that the, uh, the flowers um, change color to, to red uh, once they've already been visited. Now, you don't see this in all, all species because we've hybridized a lot of the trees and so there are different versions of them around. But in the original horse chestnuts, you definitely get this effect. And the thing is that bees and most other insects don't see the color red very well. They see green, blue, and ultraviolet, which we can't see. And so to a bee, it probably looks a bit like that. And they, I'm anthropomorphizing a bit, but they'll be more attracted to the uh, flowers that are, uh, are still yellow, uh, which they absolutely can see. And uh, that way, the tree doesn't have to continue making nectar in the wrong places. The flowers get pollinated with the minimum effort from the bees. Damn clever, isn't it? It's a lovely um, uh, image from Lucille Clerk there. We, I, I chose Kiev as the place that has more, um, more horse chestnut trees than anywhere else. So you might wonder, why are some trees, uh, why do they have bright red flowers if, if, um, uh, if they can't be perceived very well by insects, uh, and yet they need to be pollinated? And other than the things that uh, human beings have bred uh, to be that, uh, to these colors, if they occur naturally, then they're probably not pollinated by insects. And these big uh, I mean, they, it's called flamboyant, and they really are flamboyant flowers. When you see bright red things like this, um, they're very often pollinated by birds. So they're there to attract birds. And you find a lot in, in, in terms of the United States, you'd find those in Florida, I guess, and, and uh, places like that. Lots and lots of nectar in exchange, though. So, and, and if you imagine you're a hummingbird, where you really, really have to get a lot of sugar to keep going, um, then... It, all, all the flowers that, are, attract honey, uh, that, that attract hummingbirds tend to be very bright reds and, and yellows. Have you come across durians? Uh, the durian, uh, about three weeks ago, there was a, a scare in uh, Malaysia where someone thought there was a gas leak in a big, um, big public building. It turned out that someone had left a durian in the uh, air conditioning. <laughs> Um, the, these are uh, amazing things, uh, and uh, hotels and, uh, uh, and airlines often say no durians allowed. Um, it, it's, uh, I, I think that uh, there was someone, uh, um, a, a chef, I think, from, uh, from here who died, unfortunately, recently called Anthony Bourdin, um, uh, described uh, eating a durian as he, he said it was like French kissing your dead grandmother. Um, uh, <laughs> which um, I, I, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I'm quite pleased I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, that smell uh, of the fruit um, uh, is fantastically uh, attractive to certain animals which can also get through the tough outer casing. So having made the, um, uh, made, made the babies, essentially the seeds there, you need to have them dispersed by something. And... Uh, It'll, it'll uh, it, you know, there are these monkeys and whatnot that'll uh, disperse them. But the flowers of the durian are these um, big, blousy things that smell a bit of uh, sort of sour milk, uh, which is fantastically attractive to bats. 
So um, a lot of tropical trees are bat pollinated. And they'll make pints of this stuff, um, uh, a durian tree. This is a durian. So as I say, once you've had sex, you've got your babies, um, and you need to spread the seed. And you could do that by wind, you know, the kapok that used for stuffing teddy bears. Um, the cannonball tree, uh, you'd think these things aren't going to go very far, uh, but actually there's a, um, uh, you know, there are, there are wild pigs that will uh, snuffle about and spread the seeds. Um, and uh, I noticed that you've got squirrels out here. Uh, and we, we have them in, in, in Europe as well. And squirrels are fantastically forgetful animals, so they steal all the seeds, the, the nuts, the seeds, uh, bury them and then forget where they put them which is terrific for the trees, obviously, because then they germinate into other trees. Very important. So coconuts, um, interesting that they have uh, been dispersed by water. So they, they've evolved to be dispersed by water. So palm tr coconut palms grow near, near water, and these things float very well. And if you track um, the genetic makeup of coconuts and see how they spread around the world, and then compare that with the uh, genetic makeup of people and how they've spread around the world, you can see that they both use the same ocean currents to go from one place to another, which is a neat thing. And this one, go on, you can laugh. <laughs> so, okay, so just as an aside, you know, if, with the British audience, there, there are two ways you can get people to laugh absolutely every time. One is to do anything kind of slightly naughty and sexual, and the other one is to say the word lavatory, and everyone just <laughs> laughs. So, um, but I know you're not laughing at the word lavatory. You're laughing at the British laughing at the word lavatory. <laughs> so, so this is um, the world's largest seed, and it's called the coco de mer. And uh, the name that seems to have spawned, um, you know, a thousand adult shots. Uh, but the, uh, you can see why <laughs> it might have that kind of reputation as an aphrodisiac. In the uh, 18th century, these would sell for about 400 pounds. Uh, each, which uh, I think is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars now, right? And uh, in fact, it was forbidden for ordinary people to own them. It was just really for royalty for quite some time. And these things weigh, uh, you know, as much as the sort of your. They're, they're like a kind of uh, carry-on bag, the heaviest one that you could be allowed on a tr on a plane with. It's about sort of 25, 30 kilos or something, um, 60. 60 pounds, 60 or 70 pounds, uh, very heavy. And you would think, wouldn't you, that, you know, what is the tree up to here? What, what, you know, what is the point of having something so heavy that when it plummets down, it's going to compete with the mother tree for all the nutrients, all the light, everything else? Because mostly what you're trying to get, do is to get the seed as far away as possible f so it's not competing with mum, right? Um, and in this case, what happens, I mean, you really don't want to be camping under one of these. Um, this 30-kilo uh, thing plummets down, and then it sends out a shoot through something which looks like a bit like an umbilical cord. Um, and over to where the wall is, uh, it then puts down its roots and grows a tree over there, but using the nutrients from over here. A fantastic thing. And it's an example of uh, what's called island gigantism. These things grow uh, in uh, islands near the Seychelles uh, in the Indian Ocean. And when you have completely isolated communities like that, um, you sometimes get uh, giant uh, species uh, because the only way they can compete with each other is just by being bigger. <laughs> uh, so you get huge tortoises and uh, huge seeds like this. Um, some of the things that are uh, spread by birds uh, show up incredibly well. So uh, blackberries are very common in the UK. Um, the, these are yew berries, uh, the, the um, uh, yew, yew tree, very poisonous, uh, or, the, or at least everything other than the red bit is poisonous, as it happens, uh, but very attractive to birds and, uh, and the pine cones as well. Um, for a, in bird's eye vision, that actually looks quite, uh, st stands out quite well. And uh, a lot of plants deliver with them a bit of laxative, right? So if you, if you imagine that your, uh, your strategy is to be eaten by something and then pooed out somewhere else, right, then you don't want to stay too long inside the digestive tract 
of an animal because it's full of stuff that might digest your seed, right? So ideally what you want is for it to kind of canter over there somewhere and get rid of those seeds with a little pile of fertilizer. Uh, and that's what, what figs do. Um, and, and you'll find that most fruit are a bit laxative for that reason. One of my favorite trees, you wouldn't believe that's a real tree, would you? So it looks like one of those things that's used to disguise radio antennas. But that, that's a, um, a, a, called the traveler's palm or, or traveler's tree uh, from Madagascar. And uh, it's called that because, first of all, if you drill a little hole uh, or just stick in a straw near the bottom, you can suck out clean water to drink. Um, it's full of wriggly things. <laughs> uh, I've tried it. <laughs> it's not, not great. But, the, uh, but you know, if you were dying of thirst, you would do that. And the other thing is that these, uh, this sort of fan shape um, always points in the same way, right? So you can use these things as a compass, which would be great if it, only it was true. So any Madagascan biologist will tell you what I've just told you. Uh, but I went to Google Earth, and I... Um, I said to, him, you know, to some of the guys in the office there in Madagascar, I said, look, they're all pointing at different angles. This just can't be right. And they said, oh, no, no, it's just a fault with Google. It's just, you know. <laughs> so um, uh, they don't all actually point in the same direction, but you can suck out the water. But the interesting thing about this tree is that it's, it's a member of the same family as you, you've probably seen from uh, you know, the bird of paradise flower. You've probably seen it in, in flower shops. Um, it's, it's the same, you can see the very similar structure there. It's the same, same family. Uh, and it has these, uh, these bracts uh, that, you know, uh, are full of, full of nectar um, that uh, need to be levered open by something. And the interesting thing about uh, all the other um, plants in this family anywhere in the world is that they all have bright red or yellow seeds. And the odd thing about this one in Madagascar, which hived off from the rest of Africa about 90 million years ago, so it's got its own sort of populations of plants, the interesting thing is that it's got these bright blue seeds. And there are very few things, actually, that have bright blue seeds. There aren't many around. And you sort of wonder, well, what is it that can lever open those um, bracts to get at the nectar? Uh, when, it, when it's going to um, pollinate the, the flowers. And then what is it that might be especially attracted to something that's bright blue once the seeds are there? And I give you, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a, a, a roughed lemur. And uh, it's sort of looking permanently startled. And um, the thing about the, the relationship between the roughed lemur and the, palm tree, the traveler's palm is that this is the only thing that can actually lever open those bracts, right, to, to do the pollination. And if anything happens to the lemur, then the tree goes extinct as well. And all the other little things, all the other little critters that, that sort of live on it. And the, thing that, the, the reason that it likes the blue color so much is that primates like us, uh, we have red, green, and blue receptors in our eyes. We have trichromatic vision. Um, the... Uh, this is a sort of prosimian. It's not quite, uh, it hasn't evolved in the same root as we have. And it only has green and blue receptors. So there's no point in the plant making anything sort of red or yellow or anything. Um, it's, uh, it, it just can't see those, those colors. So, but it's very good at discriminating the blue from the greens around. Um, a mention of the sandbox tree. This is a... a a native of Costa Rica, and uh, it has these um, seed pods here that are like a kind of tangerine. And when they, uh, when they dry off, they dry at a sort of, uh, different parts of it dry at a different rate. And you get these incredibly big stresses formed in this kind of quite woody structure. And I know that you all are very familiar with the sound of gunfire because of, you know, that's how you live here. But, um, <laughs> In Europe, we're not used to that quite so much. And I remember uh, the first time I, I was in a grove of these trees when it was a hot day and they were, uh, the, the, these things had got to the point where they were ready to pop and spread their seed around, um, that it really sounded like a gun battle going on. I mean, it was amazing, uh, huge bangs. These 
uh, seeds, which are about the size, uh, they're a little bit bigger than your cent, one cent coin. They're like little miniature frisbees, and they come spinning out at about 150 miles an hour, right? Um, believe me, that can hurt. Uh, and there are, there are wonderful stories of people sort of in the 19th century collecting these and having them on the shelf, and you know what happens next, right? Um, so they go out, and they'll travel about uh, 150 feet or so um, and not compete with the mother tree that way. Uh, amazing. So look, <laughs> where am I going? Trees, uh, you know, on top of the water, the food, the defense, uh, the way that they need to communicate information with each other, um, uh, they obviously need space, um, and they need love. Uh, you know, they need some uh, uh, attention. And one of the problems with climate change, um, you, you know, one of the questions I get about climate change is you said that trees are made of carbon dioxide. Uh, if we have more CO2 in the atmosphere, isn't that somehow good for trees, right? It's a very sensible question to ask. And it's true that if you just have a bit more carbon dioxide in the air, then plants do grow a bit faster generally. But the trouble is, with the carbon dioxide comes heat, right? And it, the, the trees haven't necessarily evolved to uh, cope with the range of temperature that comes with increased carbon dioxide. And the other thing that happens is that all the little critters, all the little things that depend on each other uh, for pollinating, for flying from one to the next, for eating something here and pooing it out there, they might have a different timetable now because the tree is ripening or its buds are bursting at a different time of year. And that's one of the reasons why climate change is so devastating for things that can't up sticks and move very easily. So trees need some love, and what you need to do is plant and protect woodland, which obviously you'll be doing, I'm sure. Um, people ask me, uh, you know, if I was a tree, what tree would I like to be? And I... Um, uh, or actually, people don't ask. One person asked me, and I thought it was a great... <laughs> it's like, I'm on the train, and everyone's coming up saying, what tree would you like to be? But um, th this, this is in Namibia about uh, a month ago. And I, uh, one of the reasons I think I'd like to be that tree is not because it's incredibly resilient and it grows into this sort of wonderful, huge thing. It's actually much bigger than that. I'm, I'm, I'm in the foreground here, so I look bigger, if you know what I mean. But it's not just that it grows in the middle of a desert where nothing much else will grow and it thrives and it's wonderful and all that. But it's because um, it's the national tree of Namibia so that when people see it, they smile, right? It's like driving a Morris Minor. Everyone's smiling at you. Um, or maybe, yes, smiling with you or at you, I don't know. Um, and then the second thing is it's got this sort of milky, powdery surface that immediately makes you want to touch it. It's actually evolved to um, uh, reflect ultraviolet light so it doesn't get damaged uh, under such uh, brilliant light. But it's got this sort of wonderful surface that people want to stroke. So the idea of, of being uh, something that people smile at and want to touch, I think that's the tree that I'd <laughs> like to be. <laughs> Thanks. Shall we do questions? <laughs> We have time for only one or two questions, and the others will be um, put outside. But um, Sorry, did I go on for too long? That's perfectly fine. Everybody wanted to hear you, John. Oh, sorry. Uh, but yeah. if there is anybody with an urgent question, please raise your hand. There's no such thing as a dumb question. I, I mean, we might, we might laugh at you, but... Yeah. I wanted to ask about um, what you described as the, in the defense. You said how the information, the tree that would produce tannin to combat an insect would transfer this information to other trees. I wanted to ask if this is just for that kind of a tree or is the information is basically an insect is coming, everybody prepare their own weapons, sort of one tree is a tanning and the other is maybe something else. So is it just yeah, for yeah. So, tanning so the, or is it in general? Yeah. So, so we're taught at, at school, at least in Europe, that um, you know, the relationship between trees in a forest is very competitive and that they're struggling for light and they don't cooperate at all. Um, it turns out that not only are trees uh, sending information which is used by other trees of the same species, but also trees of other species as well. Now, what we don't have evidence of is intentionality. 
right? So it, it isn't necessarily that this tree is thinking, do you know what? I need to send a, a special message to that conifer or that birch tree over there. They're kind of eavesdropping on each other through the, through the fungal network is the way I would think about it. But it certainly happens between species. And the other thing that, that trees do is not just the information, but the products of photosynthesis. At any one time in a forest, we think that about 5% of the total products of photosynthesis may be being swapped through these fungal networks, not only between trees of the same species, but also trees of different species, particularly, for example, at the start and end of seasons, where at the start of the season, the conifers are already um, photosynthesizing, uh, but the deciduous trees haven't grown their leaves very well yet. So the conifers are giving carbon and sugar to the deciduous trees. And at the other end of the season, it's the opposite. So yes, it happens across, across species boundaries, but not necessarily intentionally. So New York, yeah. hi, uh, New York City has a million tree initiative. Uh, do you know of other urban areas that have similar plans and what trees are particularly adept at uh, thriving in an urban environment? Well, it, there are other cities that, that do around the world. Um, uh, the, I, I'd say two things. One, be very, very careful about what you plant. So you might have heard of something called the tree of heaven, <laughs> Elanthus, sort of tree of hell, really, um, uh, which the US Department of Agriculture in the uh, early part of the uh, 20th century encouraged people to plant all over the place. <laughs> Uh, and now they're kind of wishing they hadn't. So there are certain trees that do very well. Depending on your soil, uh, you might want um, trees that don't sort of suck up too much water in clay, clay soil because it can destabilize and so on. So every city would be, would be different. There's just one thing I would say about uh, an, uh, you know, something to remember with mathematics, and that is that a million trees sounds like an awful lot, um, but a million is a thousand by a thousand, and then it doesn't quite feel like so many. So it is a lot for a city, that's fantastic, but if someone's talking about a forest, uh, you know, they're going to plant a new forest somewhere, um, then a million trees isn't necessarily very much because you think, well, you might plant the seedlings as sort of uh, two, two yards apart, and then, you know, 2,000 yards by 2,000 yards isn't like an enormous forest, okay? So it, it's just a, a way of thinking about it. We'll have to leave it at that. Oh, um, I'm really sorry. Please, no, uh, th there will be an opportunity to ask more questions as you buy the book. Just think of reading it this weekend and being super learned about trees on Monday. And Perfect Christmas gift. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> thank you very much.